Hey guys, welcome to the General's Workshop. I'm gonna make one assumption that if you're watching this video, you are a beginner in how to laminate a surface, right? So I am gonna try to gear this video towards you. And here's what that means. I'm gonna try to take each detail that a lot of times are taken for granted by individuals that might kind of really know the process. And let's be honest, it's just that they've had the experience to do it multiple times. So they're past that point of all the beginning questions. But I do remember the first time that I was doing mine and there were so many questions. Like for instance, after you apply the contact cement, did you know that there's a specific time at which you have to press the board together before you have to actually reactivate the coating? Most people don't even talk about that. So we're gonna go over that. We're gonna go over a variety of different details. That's gonna be super important for you to know. So with that being said, let's build the tabletop. Although making the tabletop is not necessarily within the scope of this particular video, there are a few steps that I think it's absolutely imperative that we do and do well. One, whatever you choose to do with the edge banding, we have to make sure that it is flush with the top, followed by brushing it off and getting it as clean as possible. That's including using a damp rag just to make sure that it's done. We just gotta give a little bit of time in between and then guess what, we're ready to go. So let's go ahead and go over some of the basic tools that you are going to be needing for this. Uh, there are a couple of ones that rank in high priority, if you will. For me, it is gonna be this right here. And this is an extendable heavy duty floor and wall roller. So there's a multitude of different uh, things you can use this for. Uh, this is uh, seven and a half inches wide and this is 17 inches from top to bottom. However, if I rotate this, I can extend that out, right? And then I can make it actually go up to roughly 27 inches uh, long. And then I just tighten that back down. And again, that's way if you're using it on the floor for a different purpose or the wall, it gives you a little bit more of a, a handle and then rotate in, pulls it back and I can use it again. That just allows me to get a heavier distribution of the weight on this uh, because the reality is later on, you do have to apply a certain amount of force, which we're gonna cover later, a certain amount of force for the bonding to happen at efficiency, if you will. Now, also, there is a scoring knife, and this is something that you can honestly get for about $7.99. Now, there's a lot of people that will say that you can use a carpenter knife, an X-Acto knife, right? And that is true. Here's what I found. This is a very rigid blade. You want to have something that doesn't have a lot of deflection or when you pull on a blade that it's going to bend a lot. Why? It's just going to allow you to prevent it from walking, right? Not 100% prevent it. There's always still a possibility, even with this, if I pull it out. Uh, however, I believe with this, it becomes a lot less likely that you're going to do that. And this is nothing more than a rigid blade with a, a blunt end and that works its way down to a point, if you will. Okay, so there's a scoring knife. And of course, we're gonna have um, our roller and we're gonna be using uh, this and this is a high density foam. And some of you might be wondering, well, couldn't I just use a roller nap? Um, I've already got some 3 8 inch roller naps or, or what have you, right? More traditional to, to painting. Um, and the reason why, if, well, if you're gonna do that, if you have to, and that's what you choose to do, just try to use the non-shedding kind, right? Because all those bristles that are in those can actually dislodge as you're applying it. And then that, of course, gets stuck in between the two surfaces. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that will just get embedded in the, uh, the layer of the contact cement. And to a large degree, that is true. And there's a high probability that you wouldn't even notice. But if you're gonna be doing this, let's try to do it right in a sense that you're gonna minimize the amount of debris, whether that's sawdust floating in the air or whether or not that's uh, bristles or if you will, hairs from your actual um, rollers. Uh, we're gonna try to do that. So the other thing, I, I like to use these, these are blunted. So these are almost like a notched squeegee, which that could work too. You just need a more of a rigid notch squeegee. Um, and again, they're blunted so that once you uh, apply your glue, you can actually utilize this to spread it out. Because if you've ever uh, applied the glue, you know that it's like trying to spread honey. It's very thick and it can be difficult to do. This is simply an option. You don't have to do that. In fact, most of the time you see people, they'll put their glue in here, they'll get it on their roller. You're just not gonna be able to, be able to get a lot of, um, you're not gonna be able to get a lot of material down quickly with a foam roller because one, they just don't hold a lot of material because they're foam. That's one of the benefits of having more of the, uh, the other rollers that I was describing to you because they hold a lot of material um, at once. Uh, now, 
I also want to point out, notice that there's a, a red, there's a green, and there's a few more in between. I'm going to be using the red, so most of the details we'll be going over has to do with the red. You might be wondering, what is the difference between the red and the green when it comes to the contact cement? And the green is a newer version where it's a uh, lower odor, if you will. It's a lower odor formula, right? The VOC rating is going to be less on this. It is why on the red, they strongly, strongly advise you to do it in a well-ventilated area. So for me, in my shop, I'm going to open up the garage doors and uh, it'll be well ventilated. The other thing to keep in mind is these things are highly flammable. So they recommend that you don't do it in the garage where you have the pilot light to your, um, you don't have the pilot light to your water heater or a stove or something of that nature that's going that could ignite. I mean, if you guys, when you guys look at this and you see, <laughs> when you look at this, can you see that there? All the different warnings on making sure I mean, they are telling you turn off all of your gas valves if you have to do it within there because the vapors can travel along the floor to any source of heat spark or flame in the next room or in the basement if that's where you're doing it. And again, all of this, danger, flammable liquid and vapors, harmful, harmful. So really take that seriously as far as wearing one, a respirator for yourself, as well as doing this in a well ventilated area. You probably won't see it, but I've got a, a massive garage door on that side, that's gonna be up while we're actually doing this, okay? So just make sure you take those uh, very seriously, okay? So with that being said, this is how we're gonna get started. These are the tools that you need. Um, I wanted to talk just real briefly about choosing a substrate. Um, <laughs> what you notice is that mine is a little bit thicker than your average three quarter inch piece, and that's on purpose, right? One question I would ask you is if you're doing this for your kitchen, then you can get away with a, a thinner board, if you will, if you're doing a countertop. Uh, but if you're doing it for like a shop, then a top like this, are you going to be utilizing T-tracks? Are you gonna be embedding in any of the tracks into this? Then you're gonna wanna consider going um, a thicker. Now, because I plan to do that on that table as well as this table, what I have chosen to do is to do a three quarter inch piece of maple veneer plywood. On top of that is a three quarter inch piece of MDF that have been laminated, if you will, glued together. So formulating an inch and a half thick, which is why this walnut piece that I glued onto it with no fasteners other than the glue itself, meaning no metal fasteners, I've now got an inch and a half why? Because when I do my groove, my T-track groove, and it goes down into it, if you had a single piece of wood, like just that MDF, well, you're taking away half, if you will, a good portion of its thickness, which is gonna create massive weak points. So, if you're gonna be doing T-tracks, then I encourage you to do double layers. Now, as far as what, what surfaces can you do it on? The ones you wanna be very careful about is the OSB. I see a lot of people asking questions, can you use OSB? And it's a common question, why? Because it's cheaper than any of the ones we're about to recommend. However, there's just a tremendous amount of downfalls to it. When you look at oriented uh, strand board or OSB, it's got these, it's not smooth. And why that plays a role is as this laminate, you can imagine it goes mountain peak, mountain peak, but in between is a valley. And this is on top of that. And I put a lot of pin force if you will, or force specifically down on that area where there's the valley, I'm gonna end up breaking through my laminate. So my laminate, my Formica laminate needs a smooth surface. So OSB, unfortunately, it's out of question. Don't, don't, don't do it. However, you could do MDF or plywood. Now in this particular case, MDF is a smooth wood that adds a lot of density, okay? MDF is cheaper than plywood, three quarter inch plywood. Now, guys, here's a little tip for you. I have a local store, well, I shouldn't say local, it's about an hour from where I live here in Northern California, but I drive down to it, why? Because they have what's called rejects or reject sheets. So this is normally four by eight sheets of maple veneer plywood, oak, that is traditionally 120 plus dollars that they have one side that is pristine and the other side has potential issues. And it could be a full delamination on the other side, but usually it's not a full blowout like that. It's more of just small things that you would just honestly barely recognize. So for me, 
when I go there, you can get that for much cheaper, around 60 for that normal piece of wood that would cost you 120. So now you bring that down to 60, but if you can buy in batch at my place, if you buy more than 10 sheets, then you can get it at an additional discount. So then I get it for 51. Now, if I go to my local box store, for me, a single sheet of MDF is gonna cost me around $51. So now I've just created plywood and you're like, well, why didn't you just use two pieces of plywood? And that's just because the flat nature of an MDF is just unbeatable. It is smooth and it's gonna give me the best surface for my laminated top. Because it's got the powerful support underneath of the plywood, the MDF is very strong when we're pressing down. In my opinion, the one weakness that it now has is the edges. You will see everyone that has done a video that is like this, they're traditionally adding either a laminate, so in a sense, like we're gonna laminate the top, they'll also laminate the edge. However, you guys have seen my other video, like I have this lift assist for my plywood, that means that I'll have wood that will in, be purposely rubbing, if you will, against this. So I needed something a little bit more stout. I will say this, if you're looking for MDF, because earlier, I, I had mentioned that why wouldn't I just went with two pieces of plywood and that is because of this fact. When I went to my local box store and I picked up this piece of MDF, there was the end of it that had complete a massive chip out of it. But for me, that was fine because I was going to be cutting it off anyways. So if you go to your box store and you find a local piece of MDF that's broken like that, ask them. They gave me 70% off. So that meant that I got this piece of MDF for $15 versus 51 versus 124 uh, regular piece of three quarter inch plywood. I'll do that deal all day, every day. Um, now, the next thing comes to, uh, to the uh, hardwood. I actually did some slabbing a couple years ago uh, with a good friend of mine and we got some walnut, black walnut, excuse me. And so I ended up choosing to use walnut on this particular table. Um, and you might wonder what is the hardness rating? A lot of people will talk about, well, uh, a softwood versus a hardwood. And oftentimes when you're looking at the hardwoods, you'll notice that it's measured in what's called a Jenka rating. And the Jenka rating is basically just the amount of force that it requires to bed a steel ball halfway into the wood. So basically, the higher the Jenka hardness rating, the harder the wood. So a uh, black walnut or a walnut has a Jenka rating of 1,010 pounds. So for Comparison, uh, a soft wood like a pine typically has a Jenka hardness rating that ranges anywhere from like 300 to 600 pounds per foot. Whereas hardwoods like oak have a, a Jenka rating hardness scale of 1200 to 1350 pounds per foot. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about, this sheet of laminate. You can actually get this on Amazon, you can order it. I would encourage you to try to get it locally if at all possible, um, but you can also order it through Amazon. And people always wonder, another reason for getting a laminate is you can literally get this in any, almost any color that you want. You can get it in a fake marble color, which is what they use a lot in kitchens and countertops, things of that nature. Now guys, I wanna also talk to you a little bit about the difference between laminate and melamine. Now, notice that the laminate is thicker, more durable. You can actually see in this picture here. For mica laminate typically ranges between 0 0.018 to 0 0.048 inches in thickness depending upon the manufacturer, whereas melamine laminate is generally thinner around 0 0.01 to 0 0.03 inches So thick. now I'm going to take those two lines and I'm actually going to use a straight edge. For this guys you could use a simple uh, track saw or if you don't have a track saw you can also use the straightest board that you have as well. You're gonna line it up along those two marks. Now, for the sake of just being thorough, I'm gonna be utilizing some clamps to hold that down. And the reason being is I just don't want that to migrate at all while I'm actually uh, cutting at it. That's not going anywhere. Now 
Now as I'm doing this, I'm gonna have a slight inward angle towards the track saw. And I'm just scoring the surface. Now, one thing you wanna be courteous of is your surface underneath. If I'm doing this on a larger table and I've got some really nice uh, tabletop, I just wanna be careful that as I'm driving over the opposite end, I don't pop off down onto it and mess up the, that surface. So again, now I'm gonna come and I'm gonna do it again. You're not exactly trying to cut all the way through it, but you're just trying to give it a scoring. And it's okay for me to ride this along my track saw it's flat on this side, so it shouldn't really be marking it too much. There we go. So that's created a weak point. Now what I'm gonna do, and this is just the way that I prefer to do it, is I'm gonna support that side. I'm going just on the side of that line that I just created, just to give it some support as I'm now trying to try to bring that up. Now we're gonna do a test fit. <clears throat> and mine is a little bit long, obviously. Now what you're gonna notice is that, that I would do the same thing for the far side. The only difference is um, when I did the top, I did it so that it's actually right at the max depth because I didn't, or at the max, I just did not want there to be a seam, if you will, on it. And I know you can get bigger, but as you get bigger sheets, it starts to get more costly. So now we're just gonna do a test fit, making sure that's on. I'm gonna have to be dead accurate on these edges though. So, all right, let's get into it. All right, you guys. So as my human clone over there is working away doing that, I wanted to give you guys some really important information um, that I think is just honestly really valuable to have, just at least in your knowledge bank. Um, one, I would say that the glue that we're using, so this contact cement is a polychloroprene based adhesive. Uh, that is going to go down um, that we're going to be using and remember that I said that there is a lot of fumes with it So make sure that you're wearing that mask truth be told I'm filming this part before I'm doing that part So I'm okay not having a mask. You just keep working So again remember the proper ventilation the other thing that I would say is that oftentimes when you're using a real porous substrate like an MDF where if you really a lot of, if you will, porous or holes, almost like sponge-like, it will drink more of the adhesive. So you may need to use more than the recommended amount. Now, that's one of the other confusing parts. So for instance, on this particular build, um, if you look at a can like this, this is roughly two pints, which is uh, 32 fluid ounces. So this can will actually give us That way it gives you a reference so you know that, okay, I did that about right. I wanna just give you kind of that little bit of a, um, of a background. Now, the other thing I think is super important to know is when you're done with this, you are supposed to allow the project to have 72 hours of no sun whatsoever or no temperatures over 150 degrees. So all my fans back there in Minnesota, you guys are fine. But here in Northern California, I've got about a week before. That's going to be 150 by 9 a.m. <laughs> All right, but no, seriously. So keep it out of the sun for 72 hours. Also, I think it's important to note when we're applying pressure, you need 25 pounds um, per square inch, if you will, of force down, pressing down on this when you then go to bond it. The other thing I think is really interesting is we talk about after we get done applying this, we'll allow it to kind of tack over. Right, what does tack mean? That means when you run your hand over the adhesive, it's no longer wet, if you will. It might have a very mild stickiness. But for some people, I've heard them say, well, I'm just gonna let it sit overnight so I can guarantee it's gonna be fine. But the problem is, you've got a recall window of roughly 
two hours. Now, when I say recall window, here's what I mean by that. Meaning you have about two hours, depending upon temperature and humidity, to bond the two pieces. So you couldn't just leave it overnight. If you do, for whatever reason, you get them both coated, you get a call, hey, guess what, your dog's in labor and you gotta take them in. Well, then you need to let that go. Well, wait, it's past the two hours, can I still do it? Yes, but here's what you have to do. You have to apply another thin layer to reactivate the adhesive, the chemical, if you will. So you apply another coat to both substrates before then applying it. And again, once those those are added. You've got two hours to do that. And guys, keep in mind that the full strength of the adhesive isn't obtained until seven days after you've actually completed the bonding process, if you will. All right, we'll let him finish the adhesive. Hey, great job. Now, one of the things you're gonna see is uh, people will utilize, this is the three inch chip brush. These are designed kind of to be throwaway pieces of equipment, but they can actually be cleaned and reused. Um, but they'll use that to kind of see, you'll see some of the air bubbles that are in. Um, I'm gonna take it down <clears throat> one swipe, just so that you can see how it knocks down the air bubbles, if you will, because as we roll back and forth, we're actually agitating the chemical and that's actually introducing oxygen or air, if you will, and that's actually creating these bubbles. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do a faint little kind of a final back roll, so to speak, a final brush roll. And you can see the difference between where I started and then where I ended. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of do that all the way across. You guys are all wondering how far can I stretch? That's how far. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and do the other sheet. Okay guys, so just as a reminder, um, I'm gonna explain a couple things on the second piece that you saw me do on that first one. And that is that you saw me actually pour out some ribbons, if you will. Um, I'm gonna actually pour out some of my product. Now, this stuff is, like I said, it is so incredibly thick that I wouldn't wanna do this if I was trying to spread it 100% with a roller. But because I'm utilizing my blunt end trowel, it's actually gonna be okay. Because that allows me to spread it, if you will. All right, you guys, so when it comes to this surface, I want you guys to take a look at, I want you to take a look at this, okay? As I'm looking, if you look here, you can tell a couple light spots right there. Um, and we can just kind of sit back and observe there are darker spots and there are lighter spots. Now, the darker spots, honestly, at this point, it's not completely dry yet. And that is because whenever you try to judge wet paint, it's always gonna look uneven. So you can't do that. You gotta imagine those darker spots like right here, 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 right? Those are in a sense still drying. That's why it's like that. As soon as that's fully tacked over, and again, tacking over, right? I can touch this and it's almost not sticky. Now, if I were to do this, right? Then that's still sticky, that's still drying. Now, if I wanted to at this point, I could actually come and add more sauce to it, if you will, or more adhesive, but I'm gonna wait just a little bit and I'm gonna add one more uh, light coat to this one. Uh, the Formica top, I'm totally fine with. Once you buy an adhesive like that, once you open it, 
you have roughly 12 months worth of storage time as long as that's kept in a dark, kind of a cooler climate, which for me, it's climate controlled, so it's always in room temperature and it's in my cabinet uh, slash cupboard, so to speak, usually. And so I bought mine uh, just over a year ago. So I'm right at that cusp, which is why I'm starting to get just a little bit of these little yellow, but I'm gonna be covering those with this next one. Those shouldn't be a problem. If you've got any bigger debris, you gotta make sure you get that stuff taken care of, okay? So let's go ahead and get this down. So I wanna chat with you guys ever so briefly regarding my coverage ratios that I just showed you. Um, I remember earlier I said that it would take about 380. And if you looked at what I actually had left, so I used that previous can for some other projects. So I actually had over from a square foot as far as adhesive for what I actually needed. So I am putting it on just a little bit thick, but at this point I'm doing it as a calculated move just because I'm pushing past the point of the expiration on that can that I just used. So I'm gonna actually utilize it as opposed to waiting and then having to throw it away at a later time, if that makes sense, because it's still good now and it's gonna work just fine for me. Always make sure that your edges are done very, very well. I mean, you want to make sure everything's done well, if you will. But if you had to make sacrifices, I want to say that your edges would not be your first choice. How's that? Okay, now let's just let it sit. All right, 15, 20 minutes, here we come. So, next time I see you, these will be dry. We'll start putting down laminate with the dolls. That's with a little bit of pressure, but I'm not getting any goo on my fingers or anything of that nature. And that's that consistency you want throughout. So now we're gonna, I'm gonna grab those wooden dolls, which I've wiped off evenly space those, right? And now that it's all tacked over, we'll be okay. Meaning I'll better remove them. What I'm gonna do. Okay, so just like that. Okay. Now I'm gonna take my other piece here. So I'm gonna line this side up, make sure it's flush over, and also this side up. Now I need to assure, I'm gonna be pressing in the middle, right? This is just at 78, so. I'm gonna be careful not to put too much pressure over this edge, because then I could snap it off, snap it down. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually just gonna grab, this is a flush trim bit that we're gonna be using just to flush it up any of the excess, and then I'll come back with a chamfer after that. Okay, so now we've got our chamfer bit on, and you can kind of see the difference here between you've got the chamfer bit, and right next to it is the flush trim bit. You can actually see the bearing on that flush trim bit on how it rides along the bottom. And then these blades actually give it a trim that's almost perfect to that bearing. Whereas the chamfer you're gonna see here as I hold it up that it's got this angled slot here. So it's gonna actually give it a little bit of a 45 degree on the edge.
One of the things that you guys, one of the things that you'll notice is if you look back at your line and there's a little bit of jaggedness, that can mean a couple of different things. It can mean that you're trying to advance too quickly with your router. So you want to go back over those. That's why you saw me go around a couple of times. Uh, you always want to take off minimum amount and then work your way up to it if you can. But again, there's a few spots along here, like especially right here where it was kind of jagged, almost like your bearing has like glue on it or something like that that causes it to kind of step up and out every time it turns. Or it almost feels like you're pushing and you go over, start going over speed dumps, like boop, 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 right? Again, you're, you're trying to advance your router too quickly and you need to kind of back off so that it has a slower time. If that does happen, it's okay, just keep going. And you know what I mean? You can do three or four rounds along the, around this if you wanted, just to make sure that your line is perfect, just kind of like this. Let me kind of show you what I'm talking about. I ended up using a Danish oil on my walnut and got it looking really nice. I love when you add that little finishing product, it just makes the wood grain just pop, absolutely. So if you do happen to do a spill, while it's wet, you guys will wanna use a mineral spirits. Okay, while it's wet. Again, while it's wet is the key. All right, you guys, I want to give you a two and a half year after install kind of visual. You can see a bunch of different things, but this is just from every other day style use and sometimes even just weekend only use. So one of the things that I like to do is I actually will use a simple green. So I actually buy a concentrate and then I mix it up myself. So this is what I choose to use to get my tables down and get them to the nice sparkly appearance that they are now. All right, one quick pro tip for those that are wanting to have a more organized shop. One of the things that I've done, you've seen in my shop, is you see these QR codes in the back. So this week I was at the local box store and I, I, did, I had to grab some supplies, but I did not remember if I had my foam kit or if I had a six inch roller with a dense foam for split, spreading the glue. So I took out my app, I looked up, I searched that term, and sure enough, I had a kit already ready to go in my paint supply box here. I was just able to pull it out and grab it, but had I not had that app and that system, I would never know. So if you're looking at increasing the overall organization of your shop, you gotta give this a try. I did a video on it. It's actually my best performing video, believe it or not. So check it out if you haven't already. And don't forget, if you can, I would appreciate if you'd consider liking and subscribing to the channel. We got a lot more videos coming, but more importantly, why haven't you? Oh, we're friends. I'll be over here making my next video, yo. Shoot dang, what a beautiful day. 80 degrees, go get some.